And so as we come to God's word, let's pray together. God, we pray that this morning we would be open to hearing your voice speaking to us through your words this morning. In the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What three words was created in 2013 as a way of identifying any location in the world by giving every three metre square a unique combination of three words? So what three words divides the world into a grid of 57 trillion three by three metre squares? And it was invented as a really quick and simple way to find and to share and save exact locations. It differs from most location encoding systems in that it uses words rather than strings of numbers or letters to map the world. And it is used by emergency services and delivery drivers, as well as people simply sharing their location uh, because they want to be found. So South Yorkshire police, for example, used it to find a 65-year-old man who had become trapped after falling down a railway embankment in Sheffield. Uh, Obviously not here, but that gives an example. North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service used it to find a woman who had crashed her car but was unsure where she was. So let's have some examples. The desk in the entrance area where I started writing this sermon is Kick Nest Sheets. Interesting. Where I'm speaking this sermon here at church, the location is Crown Thigh Taped. There we go. And most of you, where you're sitting there, is Until Cope Allows. Okay. Our living room in the vicarage is waddled, energetic cowboy. Okay, take from that what you will. Now, all of these words are randomly created, but there, of course, have been some funny ones that have been discovered. So someone's garden in Kingswood, Bristol, is shave legs fully. There we go. A place in Sudan on the border there is leave that hobnob. I love that one, that's brilliant. Okay, the entrance to Downing Street in London, just in front of the entrance is this, slurs this shark. Mm. But get this one, this is, this is the block just in front of it, exactly over the entrance. Input caring brain. I mean, what are the chances of that? Input caring brain, brilliant. I would suggest you download the app. It's great fun as well as really helpful if you ever get completely lost and need someone to find your exact location. You pull out the app, it'll give you your three words and then you can tell, well, anyone, the emergency services, you can tell someone else who's got the app and they can find you by three square meters. Take a moment to think about what three words you would use to describe your location at the moment. Okay, not your physical location, but your location spiritually. How would you describe where you are at this morning? Maybe there would be something like this. Tired, busy, hopeful. Confused, hurting, broken. Family, impatient, longing. Seeking, open, blinded. Searching, frustrated, passionate. Chained, wanting, desire. Every week, Catherine and I get the Week magazine. You might have seen it. Uh, It gives an overview of the main headlines and news stories throughout the week and condenses it into a magazine uh, and also gives an overview of all the newspapers and what they have said about these particular issues. I was reading it last night before I went to sleep and I was struck by the deeply concerning situations across our world at the moment. The war in Ukraine increased worldwide food costs, which is starting to lead to famine in many countries. 
the rising cost of living impacting the poorest in our country, the recent school shooting in the US, a very serious heat wave in Pakistan and India. The list goes on and on. Watching the news at the moment, reading the news, can leave us feeling really disheartened. And I think more than any other time in my life, I feel genuinely scared for the future. And I'm left asking, God, where are you in the midst of this? So what three words would you describe for our world at the moment? This morning, I want to focus on three words. Three words that I believe are the summary of the prayer life and the mission of the church. And three words that, when our situations seem so dark, when our world seems so broken, when we don't have any more words to pray, I think these three words maybe are all that we're left with. They are, your kingdom come. Now, these three words are the title that's given to a global prayer movement that's taking place at the moment. That is inviting Christians around the world to pray quite simply for people to come to know Jesus. 11 days of prayer between Ascension and Pentecost. And at the very first Ascension Day, the disciples gathered with the believers, men and women, and for 11 days were constantly devoting themselves to pray as they waited for the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Like them, our reliance on the gift of the Holy Spirit is total. On our own, we can do nothing. And so like them, we continue to wait and pray for God's kingdom to come, his will to be done. And so this morning, I want to briefly focus on these three words. Your kingdom come. And I hope that as we do so, they will cause a relocation of our lives once again. So firstly, your. Now on the night before Jesus died, after eating the Passover meal with his disciples, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. On his knees, in anguish at the prospect of what was before him, he cried out to God, Father! If you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. In praying that, Jesus submitted his will to the Father. And when we pray your, we are praying against our own will and our own desires. It is a reversal of Adam and Eve who turned from God and said, My way, my desires before God. And when we pray your, we seek to reverse the tide of human will and desire that tries to turn away from God. And instead, we say, not what I want, not what I desire, but what you want for me, God. Alan Redpath, the well-known British evangelist, pastor and author of the last century, wrote, Before we can pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray, my kingdom go. And that's a huge challenge. Where have I built my own little kingdom, hung on to my own autonomy? How's that working out for me? And so when we pray your, we are relinquishing control. We are saying, God, do what you want. And we pray open-handed and open-hearted, trusting that God is good. And it is a moment of submission, instead of coming to God with our terms and conditions. When we pray this prayer, we, we ask that God would set the destination. But amazingly, God doesn't want us to be a passenger simply going along for the ride. He wants us to get involved and play our part in getting to the destination he has set. But it is through a prayer of trust. And when we pray it, we might feel like we're losing control. 
And when we pray it, we pray it in the midst of a world that seems to be going out of control. So do your lives say, you before me, God's will before my will. Take a moment to think about some of the bigger life decisions you've made recently, whether big or small. Did you make those decisions based on your own desires or on God's? How do we cultivate such a heart that says, not my will, but yours? Well, I might sound a bit like a broken record because you've probably heard me say this before, but it starts with worship through pointing our affection towards God. Psalm 37 verse 4, for example, says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in him, worship him, bring your affection, your passion towards God. And when we do, when we worship him, then our hearts start to be shaped and moulded so that we suddenly find that what God wants and desires becomes what we want and desire. And so we find that our desires tune in with what God wants for us. Praying your is saying less of us and more to God. It is a prayer of humility where we say, not me, but you. Secondly, kingdom. When we pray about a kingdom, we pray towards a king. We are praying that Jesus is king, that he is sovereign, that Jesus would be in charge. And often quoted, Oswald J. Smith said this, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Because our hearts are very good at building up our own kingdoms. But Jesus wants the kingdom of our hearts When we pray your kingdom, we pray that God would rule and reign over the kingdom of our hearts. Moreover, as Dallas Willard says, God's own kingdom or rule is the range of his effective will, where what he wants done is done. And so when Jesus directs us to pray your kingdom come, He does not mean that we should pray for it to, I suppose, come into existence. Rather, we pray for it to take over all of the points in the personal, social and political order where it is now excluded. And so God's kingdom is not really about a physical place, but more about a sphere of influence, about the values of God's kingdom being made known in our world, in the the personal, the social, and the political orders. And at this time, don't we need so much of that? Don't we need God's kingdom values to break in to our world? Thirdly and finally, come. I wonder how good you are at inviting people into your home. Hospitality can be challenging, particularly with people we don't know. But I've been really struck that members of our congregation are willing to open up their home to Ukrainian refugees. What an amazing outworking of the hospitality of Jesus. But it can be daunting inviting a stranger to come into your home, even more so to live with you. Inviting someone into our homes is a risk, which obviously varies depending on how well we know them. When we invite someone we don't know well, or even a stranger, we just don't know what they will do. We've got a good idea, but who knows? Will they make a mess? How much food will they eat? Will they bring mud onto the carpet? Will they make the toilet smelly? Will they clean up after themselves? Inviting someone into our home can be a risky business. In the same way, when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying a prayer of invitation. But it is a risky prayer because we're inviting Jesus to come and to mess up the order of our lives, or maybe for others, to see the mess that we've tried to clear away and to shove into those cupboards. When we invite Jesus to come into the home of our lives, 
We don't ask him to come and live under our rules and terms. Oh, we shouldn't. We ask him to come and completely redesign the furniture, to change our daily habits, to throw out all the junk and the clutter, and to completely reshape the way that we live. And so come is a word of invitation. We pray, come Jesus, take up residence in my life. You are welcome here. We pray that Jesus will fill, him with, fill us with himself, that we would smell like Jesus and leave his scent and fragrance everywhere that we then go. And when we pray come, we're inviting and seeking for Jesus to do something. When we pray come, we ask that the rule and reign of God would move from a heaven reality to an earthly one. It's also, though, a prayer of expectation. We would be pretty annoyed if we invited someone to come to our house, but they then forgot or couldn't be bothered. No, when we invite someone to come, we expect that they will, even if, like me and my family, we're often a bit late. When we pray, your kingdom come, we pray with expectation and anticipation that Jesus will come. And in part, it is a future reality. The kingdom won't come in full until Jesus returns. However, we pray now for a foretaste. More than that, we pray for an inbreaking of the kingdom here and now. When we pray, come. It is a prayer for our world in all its brokenness, in all the mess. We pray and invite Jesus to come. So let's go back to think about where you and I might be today. Do some of those words resonate with your spiritual, your emotional location at the moment. When we pray these words, your kingdom come, we start to see that our spiritual location shifts. Maybe not immediately, but in time, we slowly move towards the location that God has for us. And so today, once again, may we pray for our own lives and for our world. Your kingdom come. Amen.